Yes, too, friends. Opa. Opa. Is this like bad to do? No, I saw them doing it on like Sports Center the other day, too. All right. I'm Aaron. I'm Tom. And welcome to Baby's First Podcast. Nope. I couldn't even get the thing right. Baby's First Watch List, the podcast where the hosts are convinced every two hours that I've gone into labor, actually. Um, for now, the baby is still a twinkle in his dad's eye. No, he's real. He's just not out yet. He's a presumably 25-pound brick in his mom's abdomen. And today, we are covering one of the most successful independent films of all time. Some might say the most successful. Some might say that. Yeah. The numbers don't bear that out, but they some might say, say it. it. <laughs> It's 2002's My Big Fat Greek Wedding. And Tom, I typed it out by accident as My Bog Fat Greek Wedding. Uh, <laughs> it all takes place in a swamp. <laughs> it's like the Shrek version. Uh, <laughs> this film, directed by Joel Zwick, who's better known for directing TV, like Full he House. Did Full House, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He also did the Fat Albert movie. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. It is written by star Nia Vardalos and is semi-autobiographical about her life. This movie was a success both critically and commercially, making a wild $368.7 million on a meager $5 million budget. So take what we talked about in the Easy A episode and multiply that by like a billion. I think that's the math, right? I don't know. I'm bad at math. Yeah, it's like a billion better than than Easy A, which was great. Yeah. It also netted a nomination for Best Original Screenplay, which is fun. I have some fun facts about the about the money it made. Yeah, I'm Do you- I'm down for that. Okay. Well, I have one thing that you probably Go know. Go for it. It was also the highest grossing movie to never hit number one in the US until 2016. I actually didn't know that. That's not one that I had. It was defeated by a movie that uh should be sort of in your brain recently any guesses uh in my brain yeah. sing it is no stop <laughs> stop yeah. we watched we had a marathon from hell yesterday no it no, was boss baby it was great. fine it, oh that's what we started with we started with the boss baby we then headed not, not our first nor our last time with the boss big baby, boss baby sure. fans yeah then we watched which one was it? Uh, Trolls, right? Trolls, yeah. Not Trolls, Trolls. World Tour. Just no, Trolls. which we will be watching. Then Sing. Trolls was rough. Trolls, I could not for the life of me understand follow it. The, follow, I the, follow the plot. Extremely basic plot. <laughs> uh, then we, we had Sing coming on after that. And I finally decided to throw in the towel once Despicable Me 3 yeah. came on. Then that was the main event. That was the feature presentation yes. of that day. Yes. What channel was it? I don't know. Uh, let's go with FX. Maybe. I think it may, might have been FX. So, yeah. Sing actually defeated my big fat Greek wedding for that honor, which, again, is the highest grossing movie to never hit number one in the box office. Sing never hit number one? Apparently not. Not even the power of the children can do it? Not even the power of Taron Edgerton singing I'm Still Standing as a Gorilla. Before he played Elton John in a yeah. movie. So my facts, do you want to know my facts? Yeah. So when it opened, that was not very enthusiastic. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) What makes the movie's success even crazier is that when it opened in April of 2002, it was only shown at 108 theaters. That is a really interesting fact. Its opening weekend, it made $597,000. That's pretty good. It also, according to an article I read from late last year, is the sixth highest grossing independent movie of all time adjusted for inflation. So it trails only The Passion of the Christ, The Graduate, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Seven, and American Beauty. It's in pretty good company there. Yeah. Um, here's another one. Ooh, a couple of spacey movies. It was also, And a yeah. Mel Gibson one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they're money. What can you say? Uh, they were. It was also the highest grossing romantic comedy of all time. I have that in one of my discussion points, actually. Okay. Here's another very specific fact that cannot be taken away from this movie. In the year 2002, My Big Fat Greek Wedding grossed more money in the U.S. than The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, which was also released that year. That's a... But... Oh. We won't talk about how Lord of the Rings was released on December 18th, 
and gr- uh, grossed three hundred forty million in the U.S. eventually. But the fact remains that Ow. in two thousand two, my big fat Greek wedding outgrossed the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> the two towers (laughs) i like facts like that that's fun not only that this is my last one it is the second most profitable movie of all time i I believe that behind only a movie from five years later that sort of redefined a genre do you know what movie i'm talking about Well, that would be 2007 yes um is is it well like one of the like a horror it's a horror movie um okay let me think this out verbally so 2007 horror movies would include every movie. This has spawned a bunch of other movies. Oh, a bunch is of it like Paranormal Activity? Yeah. yeah. Paranormal Activity didn't make as much money, but it made $193 million on just a $230,000 budget. I saw that in theaters. It actually was a very fun one to see in theaters. Yeah, I mean, it, it sort of, there was a lot, a lot of movies that came out of that one. So I still would argue budget. that it didn't redefine a genre. I think that the Blair Witch Project sort of did. I guess. As but, that found footage sort of thing. Yeah, but I thing. mean, you can you can take that and you could say that about anything. You could say like, oh, I don't think like Rocky redefined it. But it was like, it doesn't matter because that's what took it to the next level. You just said, it, it doesn't matter what your opinion is because it's wrong. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> that, that's exactly You don't what think Blair Witch Project No, I do think did it, it did, but I think that Paranormal Activity kicked it up a notch. All right. All right, eight eight sort of like later. how that one movie, uh, the the one Cloverfield, yeah, kind of redefined that whole type of found footage, but not horror, right? And like the the weird camera stuff, yeah. Sort of like how the Born Identity made the the vomit inducing camera work, yes, a thing, but took it from previous movies. Like it's everything just builds on each other. But I think sure. the paranormal activity pushed that to the next level. Paranormal activity is kind of hilarious because it is not scary at all for the first hour. Yeah. And then it's like a door moves. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> so right, right, good. Right, right. It was really fun. That one was fun. I had a, a, a time where I would watch horror movies in the theaters. It was a very fun time for me. I watched. The I had a brief time as well where I did that. I watched The Strangers in theaters. I that watched was the scary. Omen remake. Oh, you 6606. did. Six oh six with that Julia Stiles. Is that who it was? I think oh so. yeah! Shout out uh, Julia Stiles yes, again. Again, uh, and then I watched Paranormal Activity. I saw a couple of like the remakes. Did you watch like Orphan? I did not see Orphan, but I did look up the twist yeah, on course. Wikipedia. Of course, you have to. One of the things that I saw it was a remake of I think Friday the Thirteenth. Okay, that was the one. Remember I told you about it where a priest of a local parish was seated like next to my group and he kept laughing at very gross parts. I think you did tell me this. I was so disturbed. So that kind of put me off of seeing horror movies in theaters. Well, fortunately, we watched My Big Fat Greek Wedding for this episode. That's true. So Um, we should do a horror movie relatively soon. Absolutely. 100%. Not Midsummer. (laughs) <laughs> uh so okay those are really interesting facts, i was actually Tom. i was actually thinking about the thing not is not that horror yeah i think so all right i've seen it i like it we don't have to watch that one specifically that's Ooh, the one what about was, halloween halloween's another good one because you both, haven't seen it both carpenter yeah, yeah. that's what i was thinking yeah. all right we'll talk about it yeah so this movie my big fat greek wedding also spawned a quickly canceled tv show yep and a failed sequel yep don't worry, though. Shout out to Verdalis because she is planning the third movie as we speak. Everyone's clamoring for it. You got to respect it. Respect the hustle. Respect the hustle. Play the hits. The leads in this movie are Nia Verdalis and John Corbett. Tom, do you know what John Corbett is best known for? He's a country singer. <laughs> no, <laughs> he sounds like he would be. Is he not? a? Con- I thought he was a musician, too. I mean, that's not what he's known for. Oh, no, I don't know then. He is I know known this. for playing Aiden in Sex and the City. Oh, okay. That means so nothing to me. So he's like the second boyfriend. Okay. Big one. Do you know who the big boyfriend is in Sex and the City? The guy who, ju- the guy who just got all the, the allegations yeah, or whatever, right? Big, What's his name? Yeah. Um, yeah. So John Corbett plays Aiden, who is a custom furniture maker <laughs> in New York City. I was certainly more of an Aiden girl than a big girl. I think that big there's a lot of red flags there. But Aiden is very well known for breaking spoiler up with Carrie on a post-it. Wee 
breaking news. This is Aaron, and as it turns out, I got it wrong. Berger broke up with Carrie via post-it on Sex in the City. Aiden, not that kind of guy. No, duh. I don't actually know how they broke up. I feel like Carrie cheated on him with Big or something. Sorry for the mess up, Sex in the City fans. Back to you. That's a big thing. And so John Corbett played Aiden, was a big heart throb at this time. So uh, this was a, a huge kind of big, oh, they got John Corbett, which nowadays, yeah, you I know, didn't, I, I didn't mean, know I like him, was. but. Um, he's, a, he's got two albums. He is a country singer. He is a country and singer. He's definitely not what he's known for. But no, that's so interesting. Yeah. The rest. I, I thought I didn't make that up. Yeah. The rest of the cast, while accomplished, were not super well-known celebs, as evidenced by the fact that Joey Fatone got the and in the oh, opening God. credits. Uh, we're going to get to Lainey Kazan, though, later on. Yeah, you I, I went, on went a rabbit, rabbit hole. hole. <laughs> it's good stuff, man. Yeah, I like it. So, Tom, that's all I got for a little bit of a beginning for... Well, that's 11 minutes, so... I mean, that's, and most that's of it was not talking, bad. Most of it was paranormal activity talk, so... <laughs> Could be worse things out there. Yeah. So what do we have as a summary for my big fat Greek wedding? All right. Well, hopefully I don't stumble over some of these names. It's actually just, no, I'll be fine. So Tula Portokalos, played by Nia Vardalos, is a 30-year-old member of a boisterous Greek family in Chicago whose main goal is for her to get married and have children above all else. Greek children. Greek children. At first, Tula is dressed in all neutral color, is basically tan, a, you know, a turtleneck, kind of looking like she's wearing a burlap sack. She wears Coke bottle glasses. She looks essentially like a grown-up moaning Myrtle from Harry Potter. That is exactly right. She's not doing great, and she's not very confident in her love life. She just wants something more. She's not happy where she's at. Some might say it's an identity crisis. Mm. One day, she's working at her family's diner, which is called Dancing Zorbas, and she sees a man named Ian Miller, played by the aforementioned John Corbett, eating there with his friend, who is actually Nia Vardalos' husband in real life. Husband at the time. At the time. And it, this was, uh, yeah, John Cor- or Ian, John Corbett's friend, is the guy who the movie's actually based right, on. The right. real life Ian Miller. Since she obviously thinks he's hot without realizing what she's doing, <laughs> she's just standing next to his table staring at him. And he kind of just makes an offhand joke to break the awkwardness, but she's totally mortified as anyone would be in that situation. Later that night, she talks to her dad, Gus, played by Michael Constantine, who uh, passed away a couple of years ago, right? August 2021. Oh, not even a couple of years ago. Um, and she volunteers to go to computer school, which made, kind of made me laugh. It's such a like late 90s, early 2000s way to describe like going to school uh, to help out the diner. But Gus just cries. <laughs> it's so cute. And says that Tula, all Tula wants is to leave him. But Tula's <laughs> mother, Maria, played by Lainey Kazan, as I also mentioned, uh, settles Gus down and he agrees with Tula's idea. Weeks go by and Tula sort of switches up her image. She goes with contacts instead of glasses, puts effort into styling her hair, and wears brighter, better fitting clothes and makeup. She also picks up a job at her Aunt Vula's travel agency. Who does she run into at the travel agency, walking outside the travel agency, but Ian, who ends up asking her out? In order to cover up her dating a non-Greek, Tula tells her parents she's taking pottery classes, which, never mind. After it's not a, while, a very good uh, it's a, thing there. It's an easily verifiable yeah, lie. Yeah, exactly. Um, after a while, Tula tells Ian that she is the waitress that he had had that awkward encounter with at Dancing Zorba's, and Ian's actually kind of into that. Yeah, yeah. So, because he, because uh, he keeps getting set up with these boring women that are all the same, and right. Tula's different. She's Greek. Yeah. Eventually, Tula's parents realize she realize she is not taking pottery classes, but in fact dating Ian, as I mentioned, not a Greek. And Gus is furious that Ian never sought his permission, even though Tula is thirty years old. <laughs> Ian continues to see Tula until he proposes, and Tula accepts. Maria tells Gus that he has to accept the marriage, but Gus is still angry because Ian isn't a member of their church, the Greek Orthodox Church. So what does Ian do? He says, whatever, I'll get baptized. He's a big wife guy. Big wife guy. As of that point, he's pretty much accepted, although the family does everything possible to make wedding planning more difficult, like misspelling Ian's mother's name on the wedding invitations. Instead of Rodney and Harriet, they write Rodney and Harry. <laughs> so speaking of Ian's waspy parents, next up is to meet them. Tula's parents invite them over for a quiet dinner, but of course the l- entire loud Greek family is here, including 
cousin Angelo, played by Joey Joey Fatone. Fatone, baby. Ian's parents are completely overwhelmed, drunk. Gus gets annoyed. This makes Tula worry about whether Gus actually wants her to marry Ian after all of this. Maria explains that Gus just wants Tula to be happy, and Tula's grandmother gives Tula a crown she wore at her own wedding as the three generations of Portocalis women smile. That was a sweet scene. The wedding goes off without any real issues, and at the reception, Gus gives a speech about how their last names might mean some derivative of apple and orange, but their backgrounds don't matter because Ian and Tula love each other. Gus and Maria surprise Tula and Ian with an entire house as their wedding gift, and Tula is left speechless as the family dances the night away. This is how you know it's not 2022. (laughs) There's a quick epilogue six years later where Tula and Ian leave their house, which is, of course right next door to Gus and Maria's house (laughs) and they walk their daughter to Greek school and that is it happily ever after until the TV show that failed yeah that's a really great concise summary very nice job Tom as always thank you it's what I do do you have any starter off questions or comments I don't really have that many questions I have a lot of like observations all right so actually I do have a question but I'm gonna I need to lead up to it for a second so this movie is essentially based on an intercultural romance. Yes. There are a few different ways to make these types of movies. For example, there's the West Side Story way. Yeah. Where it's sort of a Romeo and Juliet situation where there's no legitimate way that either family is going to accept the person of the other culture. There's something like Save the Last Dance or The Big Sick where the story is sort of melodramatic, but you know they'll get together in the end despite the difference in culture. Mm -hmm. There's movies like Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, which was filmed right before Loving versus Virginia when interracial marriage still wasn't allowed. Yeah. Where the point of the movie is to tackle the race clash head on, even in a comedic type of way. And then there's a movie like this, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, where the cultural challenges are the premise of the movie, but it's more of a celebration of that particular culture than anything else. Yeah. It's definitely not a celebration of the Miller's culture. No. Uh, But do you have a favorite type of movie like this or do you think there's room for all of them? Do you have any preference? Yeah, I think that there, of course, is room for all of them. I think that, of course, the Romeo and Juliet trope is a little overdone Yeah. at this point. And if there's not a, a fresh take on it, then sometimes that can be a little trite. Um, although they did come out with Romeo and Juliet yeah, a few and years I, ago. That's a little different. A little bit. Uh, I think that there's room for all of them. I, I did really like the... Greek culture being explained in this movie, I think that's its biggest strength. And I think that there should be more movies that that do that, that celebrate different cultures and different uh, backgrounds and stuff like that. And I think that after that movie came out, you probably had a big uptick in people going to Greek restaurants. I would imagine diners, things like that. Going on vacation to Greece, things like that. So. I I am totally down for getting more background on on different celebrating different cultures and movies. That actually leads directly into something else I wrote down, which is oh, great. one thing I really like about this movie is how it applies not only to the Greeks, but also to many other immigrant groups. Yeah. Like when I was a kid, my Italian family would be super loud and boisterous like this. And, you know, Italians are kind of famous for this type of thing, too. Mm-hmm. It's not just limited to Europeans, though. Like we have friends that are Cuban and Indian and Filipino, and they all have like boisterous you know out there crazy families um so the movie is very specific to the greeks but it's truly meant to be relatable to all cultures Mm -hmm. and i think that that is a is a big strength too that made it become such a sleeper hit like it's not just about the greeks like oh no everyone can kind of see parts of their family in this movie absolutely just not necessarily the greeks like for example i think it also accurately shows how like parents and older people from this era just like made stuff up (laughs) <laughs> like how Windex works on everything yeah. and how the root of every word is Greek. Yeah. Like even something like the clearly Japanese word kimono. Yes. <laughs> um, and I think that that was something that it, that it's a, another particular strength of this movie. That's very funny. And again, it also reminds me of all like the old wives tales we've heard about our baby, uh, especially when we were finding out the gender. Mm-hmm. Every single person, it felt like said that this baby was going to be a girl based on the Chinese test or the Mayans, the Mayans who were famously wrong before Um, (laughs) the, you know what I mean? There's all these different online tests are like, Oh, how she's carrying the baby and all that. And it's, I just had a spite. I was like, no, it's going to be a boy. And guess what? All the old nonsense is wrong. Just like in this movie, Windex does not cure everything. Okay. Well, maybe it helps with a lot of stuff though, because it dries things out. Windex? 
Yeah. Yeah, no, Windex is great. I'm not anti-Windex. This is not an anti-Windex <laughs> podcast. But I'm talking about like like all the old crap that that the old people were saying in this movie. <laughs> um, yes, I definitely see what you're saying there. There's so many things that uh, my <laughs> my grandmom has told my mom to tell me, like, make sure you drink castor oil so that the baby will come faster. And then I, I had previously looked it up and it was like, do not under any circumstances <laughs> drink that. <laughs> I love I love when older generations give you advice on things. Oh, yeah. You know, when you're not expected to take it. Right. I love that. Yeah, and it's great. we get a lot of that in this movie. Yeah. And it's it's well my my point is that that's why it's so relatable and, it's very and, much so. Yeah. So it's so funny I put in here as a question how does this experience compare to a big Italian gathering? It's not too far off. It's really not. They're both southern Europe too. It's not like I mean it makes it makes a lot of sense. They're both Mediterranean countries. I'll tell you something. I one of the first times I went to a Christmas Eve at your family's house. I was going to ask you if there was any culture shock that first. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say culture shock. I will say my family is not a hug and kiss. Right. Right. Family. Right, I right. don't like I don't touch my family members. Right. So that did not. That was very different than in your family where like when you say goodbye, you have to kiss them like 75 times. I shook your dad's hand, hand a couple times. Maybe, maybe. At the wedding, yeah. The wedding. Pop kissed you once. He did kiss me once. Shout out, Pop. <laughs> Shout out, Pop. But so that's a big one. The one that sticks out to me the most, though, remember when in my big frat Greek wedding, when Aunt Vula says, what do you mean he no eat meat? That's okay. I make lamb. That was, I was going to ask you your favorite quote. That's my th favorite that quote. That one's mine, too. Um, <laughs> when I ate Christmas Eve dinner, at your your aunt's house you had previously told her that i didn't eat meat i was vegetarian right and she made me white clam pasta yes <laughs> i was like there's no meat it's clams yes exactly <laughs> exactly so that is spot on and i first saw this movie when i was a kid so re-watching it i was like oh yeah this yeah. is legit yeah. real <laughs> yeah been, been there now my family doesn't necessarily have that sort of identifier no so i uh, you probably didn't get that kind of no you guys are south at jersey all. people just south jersey trash no you know? no not trash i know south i know some south <laughs> jersey trash you guys aren't trash no but uh yeah so i i did see a lot of similarities since starting to date you between this movie uh with the greek culture and a very similar italian bent yeah i mean they wanted didn't they want to change uh, when they were originally making this movie, didn't they want Marissa Tomei? Well, at first they wanted it to be a, a, a Hispanic culture. Oh, okay. And then, um, that, again, that's another, you know, hmm? a lot of Hispanic countries are have families that are, I, mean, I mentioned Cuban, but yeah, there's a, you know, it, this isn't specific to the Greeks. And then when they decided to stick with Greek, they wanted a more familiar actress, lead right. actress. So they were looking at Marissa Tomei. Oh, okay. Um, but then Nia Vardalis starred in her own it was her own movie so yeah. well i think i said this when we were watching the movie but if i was neo vardalis i would if if i had a choice i would would like marissa tomei to play me as well i mean who wouldn't <laughs> uh but that you know i think that her being cast in the movie brought a sweetness to it that's what i, I read something about that on online too like why they thought it was such a sleeper hit and that's part of it because it felt like you were supporting somebody who's on the ground up you know oh absolutely and there's no major stars in this movie tom hanks produced but that's not like um, a big no, that's not true, Tom. Joey Fatone. Yeah. But besides Joey <laughs> Fatone, besides Joey Fatone, there's no mega stars in this movie. Very true. Uh, okay, so let's talk about it. This is the highest grossing romantic comedy of all time. Yes. I have a romantic comedy section. I have a bunch of questions Good. for you. Good, because I don't have that much left besides my sprawling Lainey, uh, Lainey Kazan segment. And don't forget about the food. Oh, no. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. Okay. So, Tom, what do you think makes for a good rom-com? Do you think that this is a good romantic comedy? I think it's a good comedy. I kind of agree with you. I think that the romantic comedy aspect of it, it's its weakest point. The romance is the most boring stuff in this movie. It's very interesting. Neither, I don't think, I mean, I don't want to say that I didn't like either of the leads because I, they were fine. Yeah. But like, I thought that they had zero chemistry. So then what do you think makes for a good romantic comedy? I'm not like a romantic comedy aficionado. Uh -huh. um, 
which probably is a good thing for this talking point because I'll yeah. I have a, you know, specific point of view. And to me, it's mainly that the a lot of times I think the relationship just has to feel real. Yeah. And this movie in particular is just so contrived. <laughs> Like the way that they keep that they run into each other those couple right. of times is just like, OK, the, 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 the diner thing is fine. But when he's walking outside the travel agency and he just like kind of happens to see her like it's got to it's got to establish itself well. Mm-hmm. And also in a movie like this, I understand that the point is the wedding and the family and the celebration, which is great. All that's fine. And those are the best parts of the movie. But. He proposed like 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 35 minutes into the movie. Yeah. And it was like. They just met. It felt like, you know, I need, I I, I need, I don't need a three hour romantic comedy, but I need to have spent some time with the characters to actually care about them. Sure. Mm hmm. I think that's good. Uh, I know that me, I'm a big romantic comedy person. I in particular really enjoy reading uh, what is kind of sexistly called chick lit. So I basically like romantic comedies in book form. And what I've found is people have had a lot of success in that genre in the literary world with a few different tropes. So you have your grumpy ex-sunshine trope where one of the characters is very bubbly and the other is a little bit of a grump that only really isn't for that you know, right. character. You have the friends to lovers. That's one of my favorites. I always loved that. That's big in YA. But that's also, that's character based. Exactly. You have enemies to lovers. I think that's stupid. That is a huge one. I don't think it's stupid always, but I think it's stupid. Like, you know, we all watched Hey Arnold. The book that I'm reading now, (laughs) I just started it today. It's a huge hit. I think it's called It Happened One Summer or something like that. I like read so fast on my Kindle. It Happened One Night is a movie. Yes, a great romantic comedy. (laughs) And this book is by the woman who wrote the one about the clown and the baseball player. Don't even get me started with these gimmicks, please. (laughs) And so this one is uh, a Schitt's Creek kind of plot. It's Alexis Rose is basically what the character is. Why? And she ends up on this coast off of like Washington or something in this sea shanty town. Orcas Island? Something like that. I know somebody who lives on Orcas Island. So she gets like cut off and has to uh, establish herself there. And there's this grumpy guy. So it's grumpy ex-sunshine. Plus it's based on like Schitt's Creek. Well, grumpy ex-sunshine. Is that like uh, Justin Timberlake's character in Trolls? That's exactly what it is. Okay, good. I got it now. You you hit it. <laughs> Branch. His name is Branch. Branch. <laughs> um, so I do like when when they follow specific tropes like that, romantic comedies. I think that there's a total place for them in the world of film. And I also think that they're very much underappreciated. I think that a good romantic comedy is just as good as a prestige drama. Sure. Now, I just don't think there are as many great ones. I agree with that you. That I've seen. Maybe I'm, I totally th- agree. There's a ton that I haven't, like big ones that I haven't seen. So. Well, that brings me to this. What's your favorite romantic comedy? Have you seen one that you really like? I f- it's, it's kind of hard to differentiate between romantic comedies and like dramedies sometimes. Sure. Because the first one that comes to mind is Enough Said. I consider that a romantic comedy. But there's not a whole lot of humor in it. It's kind of more of a dramedy. Yeah, but the char- but the actors are funny yeah, in it. So, so so enough said is uh, James Gandolfini and Julia Louis Dreyfus, mm-hmm. uh, and like Catherine Keener or something, right? Yeah, in that movie. Yeah, I think so. She probably is. Uh, and it's just like these two like older people, like, and they uh, did they like it set up. I don't really remember the concept, but just the two of them on screen are just excellent. And they don't really like each other at first. Right, They're kind of right. an enemies to lovers, enemies ish. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what it fits under, even though they just kind of have a mild dislike of each that other. That one just felt a little bit more genuine than mm-hmm. a lot of the other ones that I've seen. It's a fresh take. I don't. I didn't prepare like a list or anything, but that's just the first one that popped into my head. So that's that good. May not be number one, but I like that. Uh, I tend to gravitate towards your. You're Meg Ryan's. You got your See, When Harry Met Sally, your Sleepless in Seattle. Oh, no, I saw When Harry Met Sally, actually. Yeah, you have your You've Got Mail. All of those are really solid romantic comedies. I feel that Netflix and Hulu are trying to 
revive that genre. But the problem is all the Netflix movies that they churn out are, are not just that not good. good. I know. So you get a couple not of good all, ones here and there. Yeah. But overall, like Set It Up, I really like. That was Glenn Powell and Zoe uh, Deutsch. You're a Glenn Powell stan. I, oh, well, I love him. But I found that like every now and then they'll try something and then in in Hollywood and there'll be like 10 movies on that one All thing. At once. You get your friends with benefits and no strings attached that came out in the <laughs> Those same are different year. Movies? Yeah. Who is in No Strings Attached? No Strings Attached was Natalie Portman and Ashton Kutcher. And the other one was Mila Kunis Mila and Justin Kunis Timberlake. And Justin Timberlake. Okay. Branch from Trolls. I have seen both of them. They're yeah, both of course. fine. Of I course actually liked no strings attached a little more. Natalie okay. Portman plays sort of a manic pixie dream girl, which, you know. That is dead. And that's, yeah, that's, that's dead. That's, but in the, that's in the 2000s. I think that when you do a romantic comedy, you need to have something different to pull you in. Yeah. I, that's why I really liked uh, 500 Days of Summer. Okay. Which I know you didn't. I didn't. But I think I'm a, I'm, you need to rewatch we're gonna it. We're going to rewatch it at some point. Because it has something a little bit different to it. I've got a couple more for you. I just went on my oh, uh, great. letterbox and I looked at my highest rated tagged both romance and comedy okay my number one is the princess bride and that i don't count i, count I don't that count as a fantasy i don't film. count that either um most of these are not real romantic comedies would you count sing street as a romantic comedy no it's a musical okay uh some like it hot uh no i count that <laughs> as a comedy yeah uh see a lot of these are just like not my highest rated ones that are definitely romantic comedies because there's also la la land which i don't count yeah uh worst person in the world which i don't count right um enough said is here great uh Palm Springs. Yeah, that's that a count? great one. Okay. Do you count Silver Linings Playbook? I do. That's a, I, that's I a pretty do. good one. Yeah. When Harry Met Sally's here. Yep. Big Sick. Long Shot was pretty good. Long With Shot was good. And, and Charlie's Theron. Yes. That was actually a great example of romantic yes. comedy. Yeah. Um, and we just watched Cha Cha Real Smooth, which was good. Yeah. I would put that in that category as well. And I'm just going to shout out to my people out there. I know all of you are going to love this one. Hitch. Oh my god! I forgot about Hitch. Hitch is a top tier romantic comedy. I love Hitch. Awesome. I know. I know we're kind of persona non grata on Will Smith right now, but Hitch. Hey, Hitch listen, is a classic. Hitch, slap, Hitch slaps. I'm sorry. I <laughs> yeah. love it. It's a hit. So those are a few on, on my uh, on my profile actually. So. Cool. I think that when you go back a little bit, you get some more too. Yeah. You got your Moonstruck. Yeah. yeah. And then like way farther back, you have like it happened one night. Yeah. Uh, apparently, there's a lot back in like the 30s and 40s. Yeah. You get some in there, but um, this one. I feel like they all just had like the same three actresses, though. Like oh, they all had like Catherine Hepburn. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. know. Um, so I am really hopeful for a nice revitalization of the '90s romantic comedy. Well, you have the George Clooney, Julie, Rob- Julie Roberts, yeah. movie that's coming out. I'm or looking is forward out. to that. I do think there's also this kind of like, oh, look, old people can be in love too thing, right? Where we watched the opening to up. We, we get we it. We get it. <laughs> um, so this actually brings me to my last question here on the romantic comedy segment. Okay. Which is if there was a romantic comedy to come out and it had your ideal couple. Oh, boy. I'll give you one of who I would uh, who I'd be interested in. Okay. And then, oh, bros is coming out. I've yeah, I'm excited for bros coming yeah. out this fall. Uh, which has Billy Eckner in it. I've got my two, but go ahead. Okay. So my two are actually two people that we saw in a movie together for Sundance. Oh. Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. Yes, yes, which yes. Which I would not consider a romantic comedy. No, it's That's the, like a it's mockumentary. The opposite of a romance in that movie. But I loved them together. It's a dying romance in that movie. And it's Sterling K. Brown. Yes. And Regina Hall. So... Sterling K. Brown is best known for This Is Us, right? Yes. And Regina Hall is best known for... Scary Movie? Scary Movie, I guess. I guess. They're both great. They're both excellent. And they're so funny. And they had such chemistry. Yeah. And I really would love to see it in romantic comedy form. Yeah. So Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul is a movie that, uh, not to brag, we got to see at Sundance Film Festival. So it's not really out yet. Okay. It's not um, even a brag because <laughs> it was like an online virtual one. It's not like we went to Sundance. <laughs> Um, and it's basically about a mega church uh, that is on its way out the door and not really thriving yes. after a scandal. I thought that the movie was just okay. I thought the two of them were great. But the two of them were excellent and I would love to see them so, in another form. So my two are going to be, it's a often named person on this podcast. Okay. Uh, and it's 
these two have been in two other movies together, both dramas. Movies? Okay. No, a drama and a TV series. Oh, that's not who I thought. Who were you thinking? I was thinking you were going to say Sarah Sharonin and Timothy Chalamet. No, I don't want to see that. Okay. Uh, I was going to say Oscar Isaac and Jessica Chastain. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That would be awesome. That is not a movie that I, I, I don't think has Jessica Chastain ever done like comedic roles, but... Not I that feel like she's she would, known for. She would kill it if she tried. Oh, of course. Yeah. So that's the one that came to head because they've been in. They were in a most violent year in 2014. And then they were in scenes from a marriage, which is a HBO miniseries that yeah. came out this or last year. Yeah. And they're apparently great in that. But I haven't seen it. I love that. Yeah. Anything Oscar Isaac I'm in. And I do enjoy Jessica Chastain. Yeah. And I did not like the movie most violent year. I thought it was good, but it was slow. It was not titled correctly. No, but that kind of brings people in, right? It's kind of like there will be blood. Right. But it was not a most violent year. At least in there will be blood. There is apparently blood. Well, they say that like there it actually was considered the most violent year in New York City. The right. year that it was set. Just so not in this movie. Technically, it was a fact. Right. Um, yeah, I think that's an excellent one. And Oscar Isaac doesn't really do comedy too much. He was funny in Moon Knight. He's funny in a lot of stuff. That yeah. doesn't mean he does comedy. No, no, he doesn't do. He doesn't. I don't know if he's been in like a off the top of my head in a comedy. Yeah, but he could do it. He's Oscar Isaac. He's Oscar Isaac. And Jessica Chastain can do no. Is wrong. there anyone out there who doesn't like Oscar Isaac? Please let us DM us at at Baby's First Watch List on Instagram. If you if you do not like Oscar Isaac. Yeah, I don't think you're going to get any DMs I don't think so for either. it. I usually don't. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see what else I got here. Uh, anything else for the romantic comedy segment we got? Um, no. Okay. So my next one is. Wait, do you prefer a like a dramedy or a legit no, romantic comedy? No, I prefer a romantic comedy with zero stakes. Okay. Zero conflict, really. Yeah, that's fair. And it all ends happy. Okay. That's what I like. That's it. Who is your favorite family member in My Big Fat Greek Wedding? Besides Cousin Angelo? Besides Joey Fatone. <laughs> It's Gus. Uh, I was going to say, I actually have here, I don't have a specific discussion question for Gus, but I just wanted us to talk about him because he's not a, he's, he's part of the plot, but he's not a major plot driver Mm -hmm. like the mom is. And like, obviously that the leads are, Mm -hmm. um, he's the best in this movie. He's so funny. Anvil is also great. Anvil, who's also called Thea. Yeah. I don't understand that. I don't either. It's probably something Greek. Yeah. Um, they're, they're great. Yeah. yeah, well, I I mean, I don't even really know what else there is to say. Gus is great because he just cries the whole time. And you can tell he loves his daughter so much. Like, he kind of loves her more than he loves the other two kids. But he also, in a very parental way, has to make everything about himself. Always. Why are you <laughs> leaving me? Yes. Why would she choose this guy? Yes. She knows I me. don't want this. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. it's so as if, good as if like she owes her entire life to and she, in, in a way she does of course like everyone owes their parents so much but oh well, most people owe their parents so much but like with him in particular he's just so like stuck in his own head about everything and it's it's just a very like relatable character. What I like too is that. Am I, do you think I'm going to be like Gus? I I kind of hope so and kind of hope you aren't. <laughs> as long as I'm like the mom, I'm happy because I love her so much. She has one of my other favorite lines in my big fat Greek wedding, which listen, I don't always think that this is the case, but she says, I know exactly which one you're, I know exactly which the one man is the head of the household, but the woman is the neck and she can turn the head any way she wants. That's- and in the movie, she manipulates Gus constantly, every step constantly. of the way. <laughs> um, I actually read that that line I think was proposed by her, like that her like mom said that or something like that. It it's wasn't in the such script. I think a good line. Yeah, it's great and there, it's used so well in the movie. A few of those jokes were not improvised, but like were added in after the fact. Well, and I think it really goes to the fact that. Nowadays, a marriage is seen as a true partnership, right? Where there's no one that's the head of the household in that way. Like, you know, people work together to have families, right? But back a couple generations, there was a very clear the man is the head of the household, whatever. But let's face it, how many grandmoms, great grandmoms, 
secretly always were able to get what they wanted. Right. Not even get what they wanted, but actually ran the place. Um, actually ran the place. Yeah, exactly. Where the guy couldn't do anything on his own. Yeah. And uh, it was because of the, the woman of the household that things actually got done. Right. And I, I think that that's represented in a really funny way. Here. That's not to put down the dads because the dads have done a lot of like great stuff. Shout out dads. Right. But Father's Day just passed. We're, we're recording this on July 3rd. So we're a couple of weeks after Father's Day. Yes. And we, we love dads, especially yes. dads that can do stuff. Yeah. So which is not really going to be me when it comes to like you mechanic can do all stuff. Well, <laughs> that's not what I mean. Um, or all the stuff your dad did for us in the backyard and the front yard. And <laughs> that is actually very true. So, yeah. And then uh, Aunt Vula is just great comedic relief. Absolutely. A comedic relief in a comic movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. So that gives her extra she's points. A, she's a very special role. I will say there is a very funny running joke in the movie that I love where Tula's brother. And then our cousin Angelo always get Ian to say inappropriate things yes. in Greek. Yes. And it that's actually a they actually mean something gross that's or weird bit. or whatever. I love it. And they do it like three times. Every time he he falls for it. Like he knows it's coming. Yeah. And he they he calls the other guy over. Yeah. And he reinforces what I get whatever the cousin said. Yep. And then you know, Ian will say it and everyone like looks at him like he's crazy. <laughs> yes. It's so good. He gets death stares from everybody. Oh, I also like when Gus is naming all the cousins and they all have the same name. Nick, Nick, Nick yeah. Nicky, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> That's also Which very is basically funny. my family also. Oh, and uh oh yeah, because your brother's name is Nick too. Yeah, my dad and, and my your grandfather. Dad and your grandfather. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um and our baby. No. no. <laughs> it's not. It's not. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> so the other thing that I really like is uh is the bunt cake. Yeah, with the hole in it. With the hole in the, yeah. this cake has a hole in it. Yeah. And then she <laughs> put the flowers. A flower pot in it. It's so I fixed good. it. <laughs> I love that. It's so good. So there's so many, I think, iconic lines in this movie. Yeah. And I just love the family dynamic. I think that that's the star. And yeah. when it comes to your favorite family member, I mean, there's so many to choose from. The grandma that's still like. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like ptsd from the war when she, she was a kid she reminds me of the grandma from knives out <laughs> but she like slightly more, slightly more lucid <laughs> so cute uh how she keeps like trying to escape yes it's so yes. funny yes. um yeah so i i really really love the family in there now i only had one more question well do you want to talk about the food first no because my question is going to take two seconds oh, okay and it's did we miss out on a joey fatone music number do you think that there was a plan to put a Joey Fatone music number in this movie? Well, I don't see why not. I agree. He was just in the movie On the Line starring Lance Bass in a hey. romantic comedy. Whoa. Yeah. And Joey Fatone. Talk played, about a reunion. Well, Joey Fatone played the best friend and the girl from Entourage was the female lead. Uh, Emmanuel yeah. Shariqui. I think so. Name? Yeah. I remember I saw I with my friend Sarah and her grandma. We went to go see that movie. Sloan. Um, from Montreal. Actually, I don't think it's called On the Line. I think it's something like we don't, that. It doesn't matter. Um, but Joey Fatone was in that first. And I'm pretty sure there's. Yeah, it is called On the Line. It's a 2001 American romantic comedy starring those three. And it did awful. Great. Yeah. When did uh, NSYNC break up? I don't know, but Jerry Stiller's in this movie. Oh, well, maybe we got to watch it. Yeah. And the budget for this movie, it's kind of like the opposite of my Big Fat Greek yeah. Wedding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The budget was $16 million and it made $4.4 4 which is wow. really That's bad. That's not good at all. That's <laughs> well, I, I gave my like $6.50 at yeah. that time. Yeah. So I which think is now like triple that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so Joey Fatone, I think that they were like, should, maybe they tinkered with it. Yeah. The music number. I think that it's smart that they decided against it. We're assuming that they decided against I'm it. I'm assuming. All right, Tom, give me give me some of your stuff. What do you got? So there's so much food in this movie that oh my God. I don't even think that it's going to be able to do it justice. So what I did do instead is I found a an article from Epicurious, mm -hmm. and it's the five best food moments in my big fat Greek wedding. Oh, great. And I want to know your favorite. <clears throat> Are you going to read me the list yes, first? Okay. Yes. So because the answer is the bunt cake. There's what do you mean? He don't eat no meat. Oh, I like that one, too. Uh, there's the there's a hole in this cake. 
there is the just the fact that Maria says, oh, Tula eats something constantly. Uh, yeah, all the time. Um, also, when Aunt Vila said, yes, inside the lump was my twin. Ah, Spanakopita. You yeah, hungry? that's so good. And Spanakopita actually looked really good. Yeah, so she says that to Ian's parents when they're talking about like, what is it like a lump on her head or something? Yeah, she had a lump on her head. And her neck. And on it her was neck. like a bulging thing on her neck. Yes. And finally they went in and she found teeth in a spinal column. Yes, inside the lump was my twin. I have seen this movie so many times. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. And then she goes, ah, oh, Spanakopita. <laughs> yeah. And the parents are just like drunk and like freaking out. And they just have no idea how to respond to that. And the last one is in the speech at the end when he says, in the end, we are all fruit. That's beautiful. Yeah. Because I think I. Uh, he says that like one of the family is Miller means, comes from apple or something. And then the other one means orange. orange. And so in the end, we're all fruit. Isn't that yeah. beautiful? Yeah, it is beautiful. What's your favorite of those five? They're all different vibes. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's got to be the, the bunk cake because that has a very direct attachment to a specific food. Um, Which you've made. Oh, yeah, of course. And I think that it's iconic enough that when you see a bunk cake, there's a less, there's a higher than 0% chance that someone's going to mention my big fat Greek wedding. Right, right. It's sort of like, I, I think of it when it comes to the show Seinfeld, there's so many food adjacent things yeah. that like, if you get a big salad, someone's gonna be like, oh, you're like Elaine. Or if, right, right, if right, 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 you right. eat pretzels, someone's going to say these pretzels are making me thirsty. Right. There's certain things that connect automatically with food to a specific show or movie. And I think the bunk cake is the big one for my Big Fat Creek Wedding. Okay. That's yeah, my answer. I think that's all good. Awesome. Um, so we can move into the Mrs. Nesbitt Identity Crisis Award. It's, I mean, who do you think it is? The whole movie. It's well, Tula? Or is it Gus? Or is it Gus? I don't know. I don't know. I think it's Gus. You know why I think it's Gus? Why do you think it's Gus? Because he's the one that has the climactic moment at the end where he finally comes to terms with everything that's going on. And he says, in the end, we're all fruit. Yes. And he buys her the house. Tula, Tula's identity crisis is done like 20 minutes into the movie. First of all, Tula is just doing what most people do when they go to college or yeah. when they are turn 16. Yeah. Right? She's just... It's a little bit of a late blooming situation. Right. So she's not really experiencing anything that is like a crisis. Well, with her, when I think identity crisis, I think like she expected what she's doing now to be one thing when she actually realizes that it's not actually that good. But I don't think she was ever. She wasn't following her dream or whatever at all. Yeah, she I was think just, she, she, she was stunted. Stuck. She yeah. was stunted rather than having an identity crisis. I feel like she always wanted to live up to the expectations of her parents. Yeah. In in the way that she was the good daughter. She was smart. She worked at the restaurant. She right. still lived at home. She wasn't the uh, beautiful one like her sister Athena. She wasn't the boy. <laughs> Athena is such, so good. She wasn't the boy in the family like her brother. So she had to be the perfect daughter in other ways. Right. And because of that, she sort of let that stunt her happiness. Yeah. So I think that her, you know, putting some effort into her appearance, taking those computer classes, <laughs> putting herself out there is less of that identity crisis moment, the Miss Nesbitt moment, and more just her taking a step forward in her life. Right. With Gus. Gus, uh, conversely. He is, I think, shocked. He's shook. He is absolutely shook. He is completely shook. That his daughter, Tula, is doing something that... She should have done 12 years ago. Well, <laughs> yeah, he keeps saying, like, where are the babies? Where's the Greek babies? Yes, and then the second she talks to, a, obviously, a non-Greek guy, he's like, oh, my God, I can't... <laughs> yeah, um, he's shook that, yeah, she's doing something she should have done 12 years ago, but also that she's doing something that he didn't 100% orchestrate like oversee yeah. and oversee uh that is certainly something that we see a lot with older generations oh absolutely where if you have a kid or a grandkid who's doing something that's not exactly the way that you did it or the one way you want to do it all heck breaks loose oh yeah all the time and we see that with gus 
Although by the end, he does fully come to terms with it. He does. And it's a great moment. And He's such a cuddly figure. Yeah. Such a great loving dad where if, too much. If it was your dad, oh, you'd boy. be like, oh my gosh. But it's great watching it from a TV screen. Yeah. And I mean, I feel that way about the whole family. Oh my gosh. Uh, they were overbearing. They were obnoxious. They were totally disregarding everything that like Ian and his family and Tula wanted at certain points, different points of the movie, like when they make the wedding invitations without consulting her and all that. The bridesmaids dresses. Yeah, yeah the whole thing. It's, it's very entertaining to watch. But God, what I hate if this was my family. <laughs> exactly. And like you said, it's something that everyone can kind of pull from a little yeah, bit, which yeah. I love. And of course, this is just turned up to 11. Oh, my God. Of but, course. Yeah. Um, very nice. That's all I got. Yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about Lainey Kazan, who is the actress that played All you, Tom. Maria, the mom. Yeah, Tom has, like, just like I had a moment with James Gandolfini, Tom is, like, in love with Lainey Kazan. I'm not going to say I'm obsessed with her, but I know pretty much everything <laughs> about her life. I know more about Lainey Kazan's life than probably, like, 99% of people in this world. Now, remind us who Lainey Kazan played in the movie. I did. I said the mom, Maria. Okay. So... I was looking up stuff for this movie and I ended up on her Wikipedia page and I saw this like a weird fact about her and I was like, that's weird. And then I kept reading and I was like, oh, that's weird. And then I, you know, on and on and on until I realized like, wow, I am knee deep in this Wikipedia page. And so I'm not going to read exactly from the page, but here are some of the things that I found out about this actress who is not an extremely famous actress. She's one of the bigger stars in the movie, but not really like a, uh, a Meryl Streep type uh, resume. So she was born in 1940, which means she's currently 82 years old. And she has done a lot with those 82 years. So she went to Erasmus Hall High School in Brooklyn. And this is apparently a high school that has so many famous people. And I'm just going to name the ones that were there at the same time as her. Neil Diamond, Sweet Caroline. Bobby Fischer the famous chess player, Jerry Reinsdorf, who's famous for like being the Chicago Bulls owner when Mike, uh, Michael Jordan was on the team. Jeff Barry, who's a member of the Songwriters Hall of Fame and has written like a ton of like oldies hits and Barbara Streisand, who we, we will get back to. Tons of other people went here. It's, it's absolutely insane. You know, Lainey Kazan is one of them. She went to Hofstra University for college and she acted in school musicals which were written and directed by her classmates, Francis Ford Coppola and James Kahn. Now, why they didn't cast her in The Godfather, I have no idea. Because she would have fit right in. You know, I don't think she's Greek. She's actually like Russian Jewish, but she could fit as an Italian. She could fit as a Greek. She could do whatever she wants. So a few years after she uh, graduated college, she was in the Broadway production of Funny Girl, where she was the understudy to Barbara Streisand. She's like right next to all these like incredibly famous like pantheon of Hollywood people. Then it gets a little we take a turn here. So she posed for Playboy in October 1970 and not <laughs> they liked her so much that she ended up operating two Playboy jazz clubs. They had they had I think it was called Laney East and Laney West in uh, Los Angeles and Manhattan. That's wild. Her photos in, in that issue of Playboy also allegedly inspired a super heroine drawn by Jack Kirby, who is like Stan Lee's old partner that, you know, there's all those issues there. But he was a he, he worked for both Marvel and DC. He's known for creating like every superhero in history, known for notably Captain America, the Fantastic Four, Four the X-Men, Thor, Hulk, Iron Man, Black Panther, you name it. He's probably been a part of it. Laney's superhero, Big Barda actually had decent longevity uh to this day she still pops up in dc media like comics animated series and video games though she has not made it to be the love interest of aquaman yet in the dc extended universe still time she also guest starred on dean martin's variety series 26 times wow this lady went off uh in addition to all of this she's an emmy nominee for a uh saint elsewhere and mm -hmm. a tony nominee for 1992's my favorite year so she's like an award nominated actress too it's not like she's some hack and you know since my big fat greek wedding and its sequel she appeared in a variety of tv shows from the king of queens desperate housewives uh, modern family Grey's anatomy fuller house rupaul's drag race you name it and to cap it all off in december 2017 at the ripe age of 77 she was arrested for shoplifting 
A, uh, just a queen. What a career for Lainey Kazan. What else do you want? I also see that I think she was in 2008's You Don't Mess With the Zohan. She was. Uh, she was also the mom and I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry. I think. <laughs> And hold on, I know this is a little slightly inappropriate, but I'm going to say it because she's an icon. Okay. In July 15, 2021, just under a year ago, there's a page six dot com article that says, <laughs> now she was, it's, it, she's 81 when she's saying this. Yes. Lainey Kazan says she never met a man who didn't try to sleep with her. That's what incredible. else do you want? That's, what else do you want? That is incredible. She's my favorite person in the world. I think that we need to find or maybe make a documentary on her. That may be our calling. It might be. It might not be this podcast. It might be a Lainey Kazan documentary. She's the best. And she's not related to the Kazan family. Elia, Zoe. Yeah. Yeah. She's not related to them. No. She does her own thing. She blazes her own trail. And that that is nothing but clear if you read her Wikipedia page. Just an absolute icon. Um, I think that's all I've got. Okay. Well, we got one more question then. Yeah. Tom, would you put this on baby's first watch list? I'm going to be honest about this one. (gasps) It doesn't hit me like it hits you. Okay. But yeah, why not? (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. I mean, I love the family aspects. Yeah, I I know you didn't love the movie overall. I I just think the romance parts are super dry and I could care less about them. I got you on that. But you did enjoy. It's it's an enjoyable movie. Yeah. Cool. I would absolutely put on baby's first watch list. Whenever he wants to watch, I don't know. Will he be interested in it? I Maybe. don't know. Maybe when he finds out about Lainey Kazan, yeah. definitely. Oh, yeah. We may have to hold him back from the Lainey Kazan, <laughs> the NC seventeen Lainey Kazan Wikipedia page. But that's awesome. So yeah, my big fat Greek wedding. Welcome to baby's first watch list. You just made the list. <laughs> All right. So what's what do we got next? Next is going to be one that again. We're trying to hit. We're trying to stick with kind of the hits now. Now that we're sort of figuring out what we're doing here, our next movie is going to be 2006's Cars. <laughs> yeah, because here's the thing: there are so many young kids out there that are still obsessed with Lightning McQueen and Cars. And also, we definitely didn't watch enough random animated movies yesterday, yeah. so we're we're just going to add to the list, I guess. Um, my students like that movie too. Still to this day, I okay. think there's this kind of meme culture around. Oh it. Yeah, 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 not quite minions meme no, culture. No, but I think. There's, oh, I gotta get my suit dry cleaned. Yeah, if you gotta go <laughs> see uh, Minions: Rise of Gru. Ooh, yes, is that what it is? Is it Rise so. of Gru? Yeah. Um. Yeah. So Cars One is what yes. we're gonna be watching. I have never seen it. I have, and I did not like it. Okay. So I think I'll like it better this time. I'm more open to things like 2006's Cars. George Carlin's in it, so maybe I will like it. I'll definitely like that. That's one of his last roles. I mean, he died in 08, so. Okay. Probably one of his last roles. And it's got Larry the Cable I'm not a big Larry head. Uh, I got nothing good for that one. Uh, I'm going to pocket that one. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, I mean, Owen Wilson's in it. Yeah, and the, the woman from Life with Bonnie. Bonnie Hunt, I think her name is. What is Life with Bonnie? Isn't that her show? Maybe. <laughs> Did she have a show, Life with Bonnie, on I rem- ABC? I remember Life with Loopy. Who? Oh, that was on Kablam. Loopy? <laughs> that was on Kablam. <laughs> Who's Loopy? Life with Bonnie is a sitcom starring Bonnie Hunt. Wow. There you go. Again, filing cabinets on my brain. Good yep. brain job there. Yep. All right. Well, yeah, we're going to do 2006's Cars because you know what? We can. Yeah. Life is a highway. Life is a highway. Let's ride it all night long, baby. Yep. All right. Well, we'll see you later. Hopefully. Please, God. Please, God. By the time we record, let me have this child. We're recording right after this. What do you mean? No, No, I'm just kidding. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.